Welcome to Civic. Uh, we've got a great evening planned for you this evening, and I have uh, the wonderful honors of answering uh, the question that I'm asked the most when I'm out and about in the community. What's going on at the studio? And I, I absolutely love to answer that question. Um, I won't answer it fully for you tonight, sorry, uh, because that would take the entire program. Um, we're very busy at this moment in time, but I, I will share with you a little bit about what's going on at the studio. Uh, first and foremost, uh, if you don't follow us on any of the Instagram pages or the Facebook pages, uh, please do. We're, we're all over social media, and that's where we announce events such as this. Um, and that's where um, you can find out more about what's going on at the studio. Um, I think I have the wrong slides to be able to talk to at this moment in time. Uh, is that true, Gabrielle? I, I want to give a shout out first and foremost to um, Gabrielle McCle McClellan. Um, she has been our intern from the fall and the spring this past year, um, has been keeping us in line in so many ways and shape and form on social media and communications. Um, thank you so much, Gabrielle, for what you do. Everybody give a please. Big, um, she's a rock star and she is, um, will be looking for freelance work in this uh, sort of field in communications and um, and outreach, um, if you're looking for some help, uh, she's awesome. Um, so here's a little bit about what we're, we're, we're doing, and I think they're sliding along on their own. Um, let me go backwards here. My goodness. Okay, so uh, the Chattanooga Design Studio. Um, we are currently, I'll, I'll share with you two programs that we have in action. Uh, the first of which is Design Your Neighborhood. Who was here in February for Bernice Radel? Excellent, good, a good amount of you. Uh, you'll remember um, that we heard from Melody Gibson a little bit about the program. She, she is from our sister organization in Nashville, uh, the Civic Design Center. She came in and talked about a program that we have adopted here in Chattanooga called Design Your Neighborhood. I'm pleased to say that two uh, local schools accepted this pilot and have uh, um, inserted in the classroom, and we have uh, about six teachers working on the program this year, and so I want to give you a highlight of that from this week. Um, and first of all, uh, thank you to the Lindhurst Foundation for the generous support for this program called Design Your Neighborhood as we adopt it here in Chattanooga and, and Hamilton County Schools. We've been working with East Lake Academy. What you see on the screen are two photographs of a mural that was guided by uh, Jasmine LeBlanc, who has been working at um, East Lake uh, Language Arts Program and at East Lake Academy for quite a while. The students painted uh, crosswalk and safety measures uh, related to the bus traffic and the um, the onloading and offloading uh, traffic uh, that's uh, that that goes on with um, the car loading and with walkers. Uh, um, all of the students noted this, noted that there was there were traffic and safety concerns related to all three of those those types of activities happening during the day. They finished that mural uh, today. Um, and um, it's part of the, uh, the transit uh, s sustainability challenge. Um, the students had project-based curriculum opportunities where they could either make a podcast, which is what's going to happen at Howard Connect next week. They're making a podcast about transit or a paint challenge, or the students could um, wrap a bus stop in uh, neighborhood art. And so that's what's going on at Howard Connect Academy and at East Lake Academy this spring. We're really proud of that program. The, the curriculum is live, and I really um, am proud to say that every other day I speak with a teacher that is jazzed up about this, wants to get it in their classroom. And so we're about to launch next fall with several other classrooms across the county where this program is going to take place. So what a wonderful thing. I want to remind you that the goal for Design Your Neighborhood is really um, not to create the next wave of architects or urban designers, but to really have students at an early age, middle school age, think about being civically minded, think about being civically engaged, and understand what that means to not necessarily sit back and passively let the built environment change in front of you and, and not be involved. And so that's happening live here in Hamilton County. I'm really proud of that program. Um, the second is um, a, a, prog a program and a project that I'm really proud of, and, and Jack Wood, Jack, are you here tonight? Jack is in the back. Please uh, give a round of applause for Jack Wood, <laughs> urban designer. Um, Jack is leading this project, um, and we have partnered. Um, if, does anybody know where this is in Chattanooga, this, this scene? Montague Park, yeah, great. Um, we have launched on a unifying vision for Montague Park, and uh, we're proud to say that it's a partnership uh, between our organization, Chattanooga Design Studio, Chattanooga Parks and Outdoors, and uh, the uh, sculpture fields at Montague Park, and uh, Chattanooga FC Foundation, 
and uh, the Main Street Farmers Market. We believe that this project uh, can unify all of those uses that have been talked about for this site. Uh, they think about sport and food and art, an outdoor art exhibit, a world-class outdoor art exhibit, all in one place, all in 46 acres right in the middle of our, our, our city. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity, and again, thank you to the Benwood Foundation and the Lindhurst Foundation for their support that allowed us to be able to go and seek help from a national level designer like Reed Hildebrand to help us through this. Um, this is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful project. We're honored to be involved in it. We're right at that first phase where um, we've got enough of the analysis and fact finding done that we're um, able to really share with you um, the deep history of the site. Um, I think top of mind for most every Chattanoogan about this site is what about the environmental issues? We can share that. And then we can talk about um, what are the physical realities on the site today so that we can be, all be informed, we can all be on the same page and begin to talk about what's the future of the site in a unifying way. And so go to montaguepark.com. It's a simple website. Um, you can download all of that information. You can see um, what's going on on that. And we'll use that vehicle to uh, drive some of the upcoming events for uh, Montague Park and the unifying vision um, and the public input process. The first phase of that public input process is May 23rd. I want to let you know that. You are invited to um, two uh, events during that day. We're having um, an event at La Paz at 9.30 in the morning um, on Willow Street. Um, and that's open to the public. It's sort of an open house, if you will. We'll have stations there. Think of it like a science fair. The whole team will be there with boards and we'll be able to um, share this information with you and discuss openly about um, Montague Park. At six o'clock at Parkside Hall, which is uh, directly adjacent to um, Montague Park at 23rd and Polk Street, uh, we'll also have a very similar event um, at, at that location that evening. So if you can't make it to one, you can make it to the other. Um, that those are the first public meetings uh, for the Montague Park process. And so um, really hope you can make it to um, either one of those meetings and stay involved uh, with that process. It's a very exciting um, part of our city and a very exciting um, the uh, park imagining project. And so with that, I think it's now time for me to turn it over to David. David, are you here? Ah, David Chalker, the Outreach and Development Coordinator at the studio. Thank you, David. I just want to say welcome to our old friends and some new friends that are here tonight. Um, we're so, so happy and so glad to see you all here. And I think it's going to be an amazing evening uh, once James gets started. I'm David Chalker. I'm the Outreach and Development Administrator at the Chattanooga Design Studio. Welcome to Civic. We're so glad you're here. I'd like to give a special thanks to our partner, partners, Lenders Foundation. Thank you so much, Lenders, for all the things you do for our city and for the studio. I'd like to also thank my colleagues, Jack Woods, who's already been recognized, Urban Design Coordinator, uh, Gabrielle McClellan, intern and Chattanooga Fellow, my uh, right arm in these projects and these events every time. And then Gustin, I'm sorry, Gus Gaston, who's also a Chattanooga Design intern this spring who could not be here tonight. Uh, please make a note in your calendars, don't miss Civic in September, September the 28th. Civic's a quarterly event that's open to the public introducing and humanizing national and international movements in urban design by showcasing visionary work being done by practitioners in other cities. We aim to, we aim to position Chattanoogans to leave feeling inspired, informed, and activated. More than a lecture, each event's intended to equip the city to think differently about challenges faced in our community. Good urban design is for all Chattanoogans. A little bit of an intro for James. James Lima founded L, sorry, JLP uh, D in 2011 after leading redevelopment strategies for numerous large scale sites as a partner at a major national economic and real estate advisory firm. Additionally, James was appointed by New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg as the founding president of the Governor's Island Preservation and Education Co Co Corporation overseeing the redevelopment of a 172-acre former military facility in New York Harbor. Current projects that are near us include the Blount County Smart Growth uh, Roadmap, Asheville Downtown Public Land Planning in North Carolina, and the Peachtree Street Redesign in Atlanta. Please give a warm channel of welcome to James Lima. Let's see. Here we go. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's great to be here. 
I'm delighted to talk to you, and I'm really honored to be part of the Civic series, uh, which has invited uh, friends of mine who are doing wonderful work around the country, and I know have a particular interest in the great work that you've been doing in Chattanooga. Um, thanks again to Eric and David for all the work um, going into getting me here and, and to help organize this, and to uh, my old friend Macon, who I've reconnected with and didn't recognize that, you know, we had, we had this, we were, those same people who were working together 10 years ago or 12 years ago, whenever it was, so it's great, great to be reconnected. Um, I'm going to talk about my experience working around the country with communities of all different sizes and maybe some best practices of places that I'm familiar with in addition to that and to try to reflect how that relates to where you are as a city, as a community, and what some opportunities seem to be. And it's specifically about the, the economic value uh, of, of place. Uh, obviously, there are many more values that one needs to think about uh, in terms of place, but I was specifically asked to address this kind of specific topic area, um, which is about why investments in place matter economically. And so we'll, we'll have a kind of a broad uh, range of, 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 of areas of discussion around that. The first thing is to, oh great, I have a screen over there, that's wonderful. Um, the first thing is to recognize that this city, like so many places that became cities, became cities because of their locational attributes, their abundance of natural resources, their, their talent, and their geographic prosperity, uh, the geographic uh, proximity to, to markets. Right, so the dynamo of Dixie uh, to scenic city is really this, this arc of a narrative from great industrial power uh, to a place that's really much more of a knowledge economy. And so, you know, historically you were this, quote, bustling mid-sized industrial city in the heart of the South. The population was centered around a vibrant downtown, and it was one of the largest cities in the United States. What's fascinating about your, your old economy, which was essentially around a rail hub, water transportation, a manufacturing center, and access to raw materials, is that the place that was built to support that and because of that, in a lot of ways is still here and you're slowly but surely, and in many cases very successfully, adaptively reusing it in creative ways. But in some ways, that old built urban form is a result of your old industrial history and your industrial wealth creation. And we're trying to figure out, is this still how this configuration best suits who we are and who we want to be as a place? So fast forward, the scenic city, uh, your economic drivers are much more about professional services, insurance, technology and logistics, and you've been extremely successful in growing and nurturing what I call sort of an entrepreneurial ecosystem. From the very beginning, at colleges and universities, with the help of public, private, philanthropic dollars, creating the possibilities for greater access to economic opportunity for people of all sorts, and we're going to talk some more about that, um, to begin to grow businesses. And a lot of this is thanks to all the things that are listed in the middle. Many cities had the opportunities that you've had, but have not been as successful because they haven't been as, as successful at establishing effective public-private partnerships. Establishing, for example, the Moccasin Bend Task Force, the Tennessee River Park creation, the revitalization of downtown you know, Miller Park and Miller Plaza, and a focus on continuing to invest in creating more downtown residential. And unlike a lot of other cities, we're working in Columbus, Indiana right now, which is very much a Cummins 
town. Uh, you have an incredible diversity uh, of industry clusters. Uh, that's a very good thing, uh, to not be vulnerable with all your eggs in one basket. But you actually have specializations and clusters of specializations in industry, but it's actually quite diverse. You also have the gift of incredible uh, R&D and uh, the foundation of a growing innovation and knowledge economy, which is colleges and universities. Uh, we have a lot of city clients who would love to have a downtown university. Uh, so you may feel like there's a lot more that could be improved about that, but the fact is you have a major campus basically in the core of your downtown, and the, the, the opportunities to continue to expand on, on that is huge. I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but uh, I, I was giving a talk a couple of weeks ago in Lafayette, Louisiana, and in the same way, they struggle with finding this connection between their downtown adjacent university and the core of downtown, and it's really, to an outsider, not that hard. But the point I was making to them is, think about how important it is to nurture these academic anchors in your region, in your city, because every single year, perennially, you churn out literally thousands of educated young people joining or rejoining the labor force. That is an enormous resource. In the same way that you became a city in part because you had incredible natural resources, and you became tremendous producers of things. Your domestic product today is very much about being a talent factory. And how can you really take full advantage of the fact that you are a talent factory every day, every year for the foreseeable future? Are we doing enough to really leverage that? What would it look like if investments in place, for example, in our experience of place, meant that you could retain an extra 3 to 5% of that group of thousands of people who are graduating colleges and universities and are making a choice. Okay, what do I do next? What do my family and I do next? And so that's a choice that Every single one of them is making. And so that's a huge opportunity to say, like, for example, in Pittsburgh, a surprising number of people at Carnegie Mellon, in the way that wasn't true 20 years ago, are saying, you know what? There's economic opportunity for me here. There's a quality of life here. There's a cultural infrastructure here. I might stay in Pittsburgh for a few more years. So what are those opportunities? Uh, we're going to talk about placemaking. Um, and it's a, it's a term that I'll use loosely, but I encourage you to also think as it about being just as much about place keeping. What are the ways that we can be intentional about the intersection of the way we use and, and activate and occupy space and, and invest in space? But let's talk about it uh, in terms of your place. Let's start with a basic definition of what is placemaking. I think it's worth reading this, right? So the deliberate effort to design, activate, and manage places in a way that cultivates a connection between the people and the physical space around them, right? So if it's just, if it's just space, it's space. But add people to space, you've got place. Fosters connection between people within the space. This is the, the core of what I'm going to say tonight. We are human beings, no matter what changes about convening technologies and Zoom and ways that we can connect with each other. We are hardwired to want in-person connection with each other. That is not ever going to change. I'm prepared to go on the record to say. And, and, and to situate the space within a system of interconnected destinations. And a lot of what I do is try, try to convince people that I see a lot of places that have said, we built a stadium, we built a smaller ballpark, we built a, an aquarium, we built a performing arts center, we built an incubator, we built 
you know, the smaller art museum, all of those things are great. And if you put them on the map, they can be a bunch of dots. And sometimes it can end up looking like a case of the measles. So we don't want you to have a case of the measles. We want to have a system of interconnected destinations. Well, what does that look like? That's where the placemaking comes in. And in this way, every one of you is an expert at place. Why do I say that? What, what defines our individual and collective experience of place? And, and why does this matter so much in terms of its profound economic implications? Well, when you have family or friends visiting and you want to show off your pride of place, you have a mental map of the things that you're going to show them. You know, you say, you've got an hour, you've got three hours. This is what we're going to do. You are choreographing a set of experiences based on your past experience. And it has to do with what I think of as uh, loops or kind of a, 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 an interconnected network uh, of rewards. What do I mean by that? Well, there have to be enough things along this walk or this, this, this tour you're taking that feel like rewards. Delicious food, a spectacular view of your river, people watching, uh, culture, recreation, shopping. <laughs> yes. A brewery. You know, all of these places of connection, of community, of culture, of nature, city, this ability to be in kind of an urban environment but also proximate to a beautiful riverfront. These are the places that people really want to be. So that combination of threading together a series of rewards uh, can make really powerful, impactful experience of a district. The problem is a lot of districts, whether it's a waterfront district, a downtown, a new emerging place, uh, have gaps. There are missing pieces. We were working in, in, in Memphis, and, you know, internationally understood Beale Street is spectacular and has just an incredible amount of national, international tourism. But if you try to walk toward this spectacular view of the majestic huts of Mississippi River, there's a disconnect because there's a stretch of blocks where it's surface parking lots and, and drive through bank branches and things that make you say, you know what, there aren't enough rewards for me to keep going. I think I'm going to turn back. This isn't really worth the effort to keep going. Uh, the same thing if there's a bridge over a river. The, the experience of a bridge is an amazing experience because you're experiencing the river, but ideally there's a reward on each end so that you'll say, you know what, that walk over the bridge, as much as we love that, and that's such a great moment for us all, there was, there's something on the other side that, that is making us make that investment. We know that investment or capital uh, is following people. It used to be that like the CEO of IBM would say, I live in a wealthy suburb. I'm putting our, our regional headquarters in a pretty uh, suburban office park. No more. Um, the, the companies that are physically locating in places are going to the places that the workforce, the labor force, the people want to be. And, I mean, of course, not everybody has the luxury of following place. Um, and so we also have to be thinking about the fact that retaining people is about continuing to evolve our places so that the people who are here uh, both feel welcome and feel like their needs are being served. But the critical piece here is that place, our experience of place, requires investment. Our work centers around this and in almost every environment we work, it's about connecting assets to each other. Um, every place has an opportunity to better connect them to each other with greenways and blueways, with public realm improvements, with mobility improvements, with infrastructure, better transportation, and the like. Creating vibrant communities means understanding the layers of financing available to create affordable housing for all price points, but also uh, a range of needs 
we have an enormously growing uh, elderly population and what are the special needs for the next wave of residential that caters to uh, people aging in place. Unlocking real estate value and capturing real estate value, not just for the sake of creating value, but to potentially capture it and redirect it to achieve the goals that reflect your values as a community. This is the idea of a tax increment financing district as an example, or another value capture district. For all the success, for example, of the High Line Park on the west side of Manhattan, which has organized almost $7 billion of real estate around it because people want to be so close to this very cool elevated urban park. And for all the brilliance of that project, they were unsuccessful politically in creating a value capture district, even if there had been some tiny fraction of an assessment on all the real estate that was built, that branded itself as Highline adjacent, that increment of assessment, both on the construction side and in perpetuity as a small tax, would have been enough to sustain the punishingly expensive annual operating cost of what is now one of New York City's biggest tourist attractions, a park that is getting squashed and overrun with many, many millions of people. And so the capital cost of maintaining and repairing that. Um, I tell that all the time because it's a cautionary tale that even though everywhere it's politically challenging to capture value for parks and open space, it is worth every bit of the fight at the beginning because that will feel like a rounding error later on. And there's few things less sexy than fundraising for operating costs for parks. All right, uh, we're actually, you know, we're based uh, in New York City, but we work all over North America, and, and uh, somehow we became a Heartland and South consultant. We're mostly working uh, in the South and in the Heartland, and we love working in small and mid-sized cities. We're working in some of the big urban markets also, but we're really all over the country. And it's really about helping downtowns and cities become more economically competitive by really making more compelling quality of life communities for everybody. So let's talk a little bit about why place matters. Well, the, the hard fact is people have never had more options of where to live, where to work, where to visit, where to go to school, and the different ways of connecting and, and, and not living in the same place where you work has created enormous new challenges. But also for communities like yours outside the biggest U.S. cities, it's definitely an opportunity to, to position yourself as the quality of life alternative. And I'm sure that you have lots of, of evidence that this is, has already been happening during the pandemic. Why have people left big cities, right? So look at this, the positive sentiment in the recent survey about returning to the office based on online discussions was 13% positive, 33% negative, and about a little more than half neutral. So the jobs and the office environments have less influence in determining where people live than, than ever before. Now, this is important for a couple of reasons. And one is that it's important to note that downtowns, and we're not today just talking about your downtown, but it's important to understand your downtown and the, the unique stresses that it faces and the opportunities it faces. Downtowns have always been contributing an outsized portion of tax revenue and overall economic output relative to their overall city. So even if you are, say, an elected official that represents a, a corner of the city that doesn't include downtown, or if you're somebody who doesn't really come to downtown very much, you absolutely should care about downtown being healthy and vibrant and thriving. And that's because you're all in your city sharing in the denominator, right? The pie. And so a healthy, vibrant downtown will have an outsized contribution to the size of the pie that you're all going to share in. So nobody should be saying, we're spending too much money on downtown. Well, I mean, that may be true, but it's probably not true because of the, 
the incredible impact it has on tax revenue, on hotel uh, stays, on talent attraction. Downtowns are significantly younger. 46% of downtown residents are millennials uh, versus 23% nationally. So again, if we're going to continue to attract this very valuable cohort, young people, young professionals, they want to be in vibrant downtowns. And so we've really got to do everything we can to find ways to make those places relevant. And actually, relevance is, I think, the key to so much of what I'm talking about. It's like, how can we make your city, your place, your communities, whatever portion of your community you're most interested in, relevant to the daily lives of the people in your community and in the region? There's a huge economic stake about you having an experience of your place that you can offer that feels relevant and something that people choose. Enter this idea of the central business district, which was kind of a, never really was a great idea. It was always kind of a, a kind of an exaggeration of like one particular land use for no particularly good reason. Like, it wasn't like we didn't have any land. It was just a, it was just a way that zoning allowed and where the way we created these agglomerations. And so part of your continual reimagining of the building stock you have, of the places you have, of the streets and open spaces that you have, of the labor force, of the people that you have as your assets, is of the institutions you have, of the arts and culture, is to imagine it um, as much more of the region's social center and really about the most connected place for community uh, in your region. What are the key elements to define what a central social district is? Well, I list six things. Of course, there are lots more. The first one, which, again, you're already doing, but it's, it's an absolute imperative, is more downtown residents. We need as many people living downtown as possible because if you want a great grocery store, you have to have at least four or 5,000 people as a customer base for a, a, a quality operator to be able to sustain themselves. A, a lot of downtowns don't have that. We're working in downtown Orlando right now. They have one market. They really want a second one. So we're actually getting to a place where our projected residential growth population, focusing on the sites that government owns, and creating density of new housing production, particularly on those sites, will get us to a density where the quality operators will say, yeah, actually, I will open a second grocery store in your place. Uh, the second is this reimagining. At the time that the future of work is being completely rethought, guess what? So is retail. This idea of a bricks and mortar store um, is kind of like going the way of like the post office and the bank teller or a landline. You know, you just say, oh, right, remember when we used to go into a store? And, yeah. So now, like, the bricks-and-mortar retail experience is much more about what we call uh, experiential retail, which is about creating a whole atmosphere that reflects a lifestyle, that presents the products and services in an entertaining way that ties in with other aspects of that lifestyle and and expression of values, and can be fun, and can be a commingling of, you know, a jewelry store with a coffee bar, or an REI, uh, you know, sports equipment place that spills out into a public park in Denver. Um, but more and more, it's related to food and beverage, um, and yes, a lot of breweries. Beer seems to be uh, the, the, the new casino as a, a panacea uh, for, for all places, but it, it really is an opportunity for, for small businesses to, to come together and create connection and, and community, um, but also new family-friendly entertainment, ways to get young families, kids of all ages to have interesting things to do, again, to create relevance so that 
Families will say, one, I feel welcome. This is for me. I'm getting the feeling that like this is intentionally created to be welcoming to a lot of people, but very family friendly. So that's kind of on the experiential retail side. And then arts and culture. Uh, again, in the way that we have that map that was the case of the measles, we have a lot of like big institutions, like we'll create the Performing Arts Center, we'll, we'll you know, renovate our great 19th century museum. The place that placemaking can really benefit from is funding, investment, and intention around nurturing the informal arts. And by that, I mean all of the small things from introducing arts in schools to not-for-profits, having more funding to do programming in partnership with downtown managers and the like. It's really thinking about how to nurture an ecosystem that has the big events and the formal arts institutions, but has all kinds of arts and culture that to me spills over into parks and open space as kind of one broader umbrella of, of the kinds of things that, that really sort of nurture uh, a quality of experience in our place. And then it's listed last, but it's certainly not um, last in, in priority, but it's, it's to almost to put more of an emphasis to say, we have to be more intentional about uh, representing all people in the community and, and making sure that our places are, are, are welcoming to everyone, are, are for everyone, and that, and that there's a process and a, and a governance of these places that is always asking themselves, like, who, who is this for? How can we be you know, more intentional about more equitable access, more inclusive programming? Who has a seat at the table in deciding who manages this and how the funding gets allocated? Uh, what does that look like? What are ways to improve on that sort of diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion in the governance and stewardship of, of a district? So coming back to this idea of, of loops, think about uh, the loops that you feel are working today in the downtown that relate from your riverfront to other places. Where can you think of disconnects in the loops today, and what, what are some of the ideas to repair those disconnects in those loops? And the last one is, is what I call it urban perches. We all love to people watch, right? And sometimes you even go to a coffee bar on your own, and you feel connected, but you're really kind of checking things out. You know, like you may be in a terrible mood, but you just feel better somehow, like plugging in and being in community. Urban perches are enormously valuable um, in part because they get us connected and they create this experience of relevance in our downtown. But they also do something else that um, is special and is a particularly interesting opportunity for Chattanooga is that they create this indoor-outdoor lifestyle where we can go from a restaurant to a rooftop bar. We can go from an uh, apartment that was deliberately designed to have outdoor terrace space so that we can feel more in this kind of nature city environment, in the way that you have this immediacy of connection to national parks and forests and all this wonderful nature in your region. We should be doing that at the urban scale, too, in creating more immediate connections on these urban perches where we can be indoors and outdoors and, and feeling connected. So how do we invest in great places? Um, I co-authored a publication for the Urban Land Institute called The Case for Open Space, and it's why the real estate industry should invest in parks and open space. One, it generates a lot more real estate value when you're near a great park and an open space. That's well established, and our firm generates a lot of data that quantifies the benefits of ne being near a great park. Or, if you're a developer, why you should invest in building a great park, because one, it's the right thing to do, and it creates community and a, a place of, of, of common um, connection, but it also is an organizer of that development that will have higher rents, 
longer duration of stay um, and uh, often helps you with entitlements to secure public approvals for things that might not otherwise get approved. So there are selfish reasons from a developer standpoint, and this was a, a report specifically targeted to a, a group that doesn't get up in the morning to spend money on parks and open space. Uh, this is a graph to show the many, many ways that investments in parks and open space affect social cohesion, health, equity, the environment, community amenities, workforce and job creation, increased spending in those places, talent attraction, and a lot of this adds up to economic benefits and for cities adds up to greater tax revenues. We do a lot of economic benefits analysis that shows all the ways that a park improvement will have significant economic output that makes it a very favorable return on public investment. One spectacular example is in Indianapolis, the Indianapolis Cultural Trail. It's pretty simple, as you can see. It's just a, a simple path that runs through a whole bunch of sections of downtown Indianapolis. It's a pedestrian and bike trail, wildly popular. And guess what? In the, in the years even before it opened and since, <clears throat> the economic impact analyses of this have shown that total assessed value for the parcels proximate to the trail rose by 148% even before it opened. So uh, this led to our work on a big former GM uh, abandoned plant across the White River in Indianapolis, 100 plus acres, proposed in a competition. We said extend the cultural trail. The blue line is crossing from downtown Indianapolis across the river and we looped it through this vacant site as a revenue generator. So look at the green. We created the green as a, a park heat map. That is representing what we call the park proximity premium. So if the blue line is the park, the cultural trail extension, the green is the radiated value. So anything close to that is going to achieve higher rents and be more valuable real estate. So again, from a, from a development and funding perspective, from a tax generation perspective, that sounds pretty good, right? <clears throat> the World Economic Forum recently issued a publication, Why Walkable Urban Areas Are America's Efficient Economic Engines. And they say that walkable urban areas have a substantial price premium over drivable suburban areas. The rent and sales premiums in walkable urban areas, they say 35 to 45% for office, retail, rental, and for sale housing. That's a very significant bump up. In our work in Asheville, North Carolina, you can see, I don't know if I have a, a pointer here, but you can see in the, in the, in the, in the map on the left, there's sort of like spaghetti of, of roadways, and this is one of their most civically important moments in downtown Asheville. Their historic basilica, their public library, their convening convention business, their performing arts center, uh, their public market. And yet, this city-owned parking lot, which is steeply sloped, was mired in controversy, and they could never figure out what to do with it. And so for years, they called it the pit of despair. <laughs> <laughs> so we came along and we got rid of some of the streets and we said, well, actually, we need to make this bigger. And, you, and, and the, the, a lot of people were saying, develop it, just build it. Let's get some economic, you know, utility coming from this. And we we're like, actually, no. What you need is a beautiful front door address. You need a spectacular park that is your front door for your convention business, for your performing arts center, for your public library for your basilica, for your public market, <laughs> you know, on and on and on. And it will be beautiful. And guess what? We will actually develop a, a piece of it with a small building. So in blue, we did figure out some revenue from land disposition to build a small building. But mostly we built a park, which increased property values around on nearby existing property. It induced new development nearby on vacant, vacant lots that were used as surface parking and cre created new property tax revenue from the whole district, a portion of which would be captured to help pay for the maintenance of the park. So here's 
what the pit of despair would look like with a small seven-story building built at the edge of it, and now they're calling it the Slope of Hope. <laughs> uh, for our work in Memphis with Studio Gang uh, along the riverfront, uh, Studio Gang did a fantastic job of focusing on new ideas to, to reactivate the Mississippi Riverfront, which is complicated, right, because of the enormous uh, flood effect. Um, and we said, actually, we're most interested in understanding a struggling downtown needs a Mississippi River experience, but maybe not at the water's edge. Why isn't there an urban edge experience at the top of the bluff, 50 feet up, so that that really relates to the life of the central business district? So it was a way to, to help realize the vision for a vibrant riverfront, but to bring a, a river experience to the top of the bluff, what we call the river terrace. And so it's really exciting to see there's a new cultural anchor that's going to move to that edge and a new sort of park realization along the waterfront edge. But what are some of the ways, you know, to think about a river experience without actually having to be down on the river? And then the, the, the diagram, which you can't really see very well on the right, shows 12 different people who looked at an elderly couple, uh, a, a tourist students, an athlete, a cyclist, um, a business traveler. You know, this was about relevance. We were storyboarding and saying, here's how 12 different people are going to move through this district and how these improvements that we're proposing are relevant to their daily life. They're already in this district, but here's how they're going to now start doing something a little bit different, a little bit better. It's going to elevate and amplify the best parts of why they're already in that place. And that's going to have social, economic, and cultural benefits. But the storyboarding part of that, uh, I think, really resonated with people. Now, all of that uh, is, is great when we talk about it from an economic development standpoint. But I don't know about any of you, but even as I say it out loud, like I'm getting a little bit in my stomach because I know from my own experience that parks can also have unintended negative effects, right? When we worked on a post-Hurricane Sandy repair of a, a riverfront plan along the East River in New York City, which was devastated by the hurricane, the community group we were working with said, do not make this too nice. She said, she was like, I will lay down in the street and, and oppose this project if you do anything that induces displacement and gentrification. It was a really valid concern, and we really like, appreciated the forthright conversation about that. The fact is, projects that involve significant economic transformation, more than ever, have to address the underlying stresses and inequities that have always existed, but to be intentional about not exacerbating it but instead trying to undo some of it by having parallel efforts. And what do I mean by that? Well, in our work in Austin, Texas, where we're looking at uh, uh, capping over a huge section of a depressed highway that separates the historically African-American neighborhood of East Austin from downtown Austin, the potential for increased property values and unintended displacement is not insignificant. So we look at social vulnerability, and we mapped the affordable housing production that had happened to date, and actually were able to show that this predominantly African-American neighborhood that we thought maybe had been on the receiving end of some of the affordable housing programs of the city was actually not at all getting its fair share of that, and said, we have to really focus on two things, housing preservation of existing affordable housing, and housing production so that there is a fair share that addresses existing housing needs for the most vulnerable communities. Similarly, for what we call legacy businesses, particularly BIPOC-owned businesses in East Austin, we did a whole mapping, uh, identified and mapping those legacy businesses with local community specialists and historians in East Austin to try to identify opportunities to create small business incentives and preservation programs. And just, there's some great resources out there. Um, the Anti-Displacement Net Network has publications and a website. 
Uh, PolicyLink has done a great national equity atlas, and and access is another great resource. So this, I believe this presentation will be available. So these are great resources of best practices for these kind of anti-displacement, anti-gentrification efforts. So with that said, it's clear to us that the cities that embrace diverse populations win. In the same way that we want vibrant places, People want to be in places that embrace diversity, uh, particularly that young cohort that we're all eager to attract and retain. So what can that look like? Well, I have to say, you again, you've done incredibly good work as a city in creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem and really finding ways to create entry points for small business and entrepreneurs. One of the ones that we found really exciting was the kitchen incubator of Chattanooga, uh, which is an initiative of launch, a Chattanooga-based not-for-profit focused on empowering underrepresented entrepreneurs, especially in a city that really is a host for the hospitality industry and tourism and visitation, creating skills in the food service industry and in hospitality um, is, a, is a great gateway. And more broadly, uh, the, the incubator, it's one of the biggest incubators in all of Tennessee and the third largest in the US. It's just really a powerhouse in terms of you know, mining the capacity of your universities and colleges, community colleges, philanthropy, and government funding. And then a project that I'm so proud of, um, sometimes these things take a really long time to happen, but in an old passenger ship terminal, on the Hudson River next door to where the Titanic was supposed to dock and never did. Um, we repurposed a huge passenger ship terminal with uh, tech office space, a two-acre park on the roof, and then two weeks ago, this public market called Market 57 just opened, and it is uh, structured as a, a women and BIPOC-owned uh, food business-focused food hall. Uh, and people who have businesses already elsewhere in the city but are willing, you know, with the stewardship and governance of a, of a really first-rate operator of the food hall are opening a second location and, and really capturing a lot of new business opportunity, but particularly for some small businesses that might not otherwise have that economic opportunity. And then quickly, you know, for our work on that Hurricane Sandy affected area in lower Manhattan, just thinking about how we are responding to climate change and as you think about your investments in place to make yourself more climate adaptive and climate resistant, we saw a 10-mile stretch of the most hurricane-affected areas of lower Manhattan as a whole series of bespoke neighborhoods that would have very different treatments. But one of the outcomes of that work was to say, what if, unlike the old days where the Army Corps of Engineers would come in to do big infrastructure projects to create a levy or something that was uh, a divide, a separator, if new resilience infrastructure was actually an opportunity to laminate a new social infrastructure on top of that resilience infrastructure in a ways that makes those investments in climate adaptation, makes those places the most social places, the most connected, the most community-oriented places. And in this case, really about putting, putting parks on top of some of that performative infrastructure. And then just a couple more slides here just to say, you have a growing innovation economy. You are nurturing entrepreneurship. You are investing in that, that labor force. You've continued to pivot your physical place, your buildings, your streets, your spaces. You've leveraged the, the academic ecosystem that you have. But it, this innovation economy is really sustained by cultural infrastructure. P people in tech and in innovation want to be in vibrant places that have this informal arts and culture and parks and open space. So these investments in place, including in arts and culture, are really important. And again, you have so many examples of that. But again, I just really encourage you to continue to focus on nurturing the informal ecosystem 
Uh, one project that's a cautionary tale, a spectacular project in, in Orlando, a $350 million performing arts center, um, is actually a little bit too separated from the rest of downtown because there are too many wide roads. So we need to really work with our departments of transportation and you know, think about road diets. You can build a, you know, the achievement of building this performing arts center is extraordinary, but if it's, if it's not stitched together, if it's not uh, part of a kind of a nurturing of uh, the way we linger in places, then uh, we're really not going to get the benefit. Uh, there's another great southern city that has a world-class collection of arts institutions all in a row, and it's extraordinary, except no one's there. Because it's like the formal dining room or like the, the parlor that has plastic on the furniture. People are in the den, you know, they're in, they're in the TV room. They want to be in cozy places. Like, how do we create cozy interstitial spaces that people want to linger and hang out in? Yes to the Great Performing Arts Center, but then, like, where, where are we all going to hang out? How does that feel? Where are those places? And who's responsible for, like, identifying those? And then for a, a Performing Arts Center that I worked on in downtown Brooklyn as part of this overall plan there, even when this theater, the theater for a new audience, is dark, um, it's really contributing to the life on the street. But when a uh, per performance is happening and the audience is there, it, the life of this particular design of the space just spills out into the sidewalk. And it's even if you're not going to the theater, you're just so excited to walk down that block on any given night. And again, in, in our work in Jacksonville, um, governance and stewardship is so important. We're working on an activation of their riverfront, which is uh, substantial like yours. But there, the challenge is like the parks department is under-resourced. You know, government loves to give up responsibility but hates to give up control, which doesn't really work, right? Like it's one or the other. You have to want to give up risk, but you don't want to give up control. So how do we use parks conservancies and downtown business improvement districts and a, 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 a networked governance of, of diverse uh, participants to find ways to govern properly and collaboratively. But it's really that collaboration framework that's key. And finally, um, the Civic Commons organization measures um, total well-being of residents. And I just encourage you to think about measuring what matters. As you go forward and you continue to make great progress in your downtown, think about ways to kind of institutionalize uh, the measuring of the things that matter most to you and reporting that out so that you can create your own kind of scorecard and report back and, and keep recalibrating about how to best uh, allocate the resources you have to meet the needs of the most people. So this really is about creating a city that continues to pivot from its great industrial achievement to become this incredible scenic and civic center that is resilient in terms of in the environment, in terms of its uh, economy, in terms of its social cohesion, and is vibrant and inclusive for all. And I would pose that there's never been a better time to make Chattanooga more equitable, more resilient, more vibrant. Thank you very much. From the audience. Any questions for James Lima? Hi. Yes, Henry. Um, they're moving the, the baseball stadium, so you didn't talk about sports venues. So I'm just curious, any lessons about sports venues as in terms of placemaking? Uh, it's a great question. It's it's really hard to do well. There definitely are places that have have succeeded in taking facilities that are used episodically and tend to have very high demands for car parking um, and making them well-integrated parts of mixed-use districts. So I would just, you know, we, and we've done some analysis of the economic benefits of these things and 
you know, I would say it ends up being sort of economically neutral at best is what, what we can tell. Um, but uh, it, there's a tremendous responsibility to really think through how, how to manage those kinds of surge events in ways that still, for the other times when it's not being actively used, you know, it feels like a good piece of the community. I really, I really like the idea of the urban perches, and I was wondering if you had measured the amount of distance, say, on a greenway, that um, there should be an ideal perch per mile of greenway or two miles of greenway, for example. It, I think it, it has a little bit to do with line of sight. If you can kind of see the next thing, you might keep going. You know, I mean, like I said, we're, we're all experts at this, right? You're kind, of, you're kind of checking it out, like, am I going to keep, you know, I got my, my mom's with me. I'm like, I already dragged her along here. Am I going to, is she going to be happy that I made her walk a little bit more? Uh, I think there's no, it's more, more bespoke. It's, it's very uh, situational. It depends on topography. It depends on whether you're, if you're on a trail and you kind of, you know, we're, deliberately having kind of a, a walk in nature as opposed to we're trying to hit a bunch of interesting things in a, in a downtown. But you, were you, was your comment more about a, in a park kind of setting? No, more along like um, greenways that could be used for transportation or recreation or um, tourism. Just to, how, how do you maximize a greenway so that it's really well used, I guess is my question. Well, you know, for a greenway, it's, that's a, in a way, it's a, different, it's a different question because it's not about, like, having cafes and coffee bars and, and sort of making it a commercialized thing. It's more about, like, what are the interesting things? Also, the uh, sufficient number of exits. I know I, I, I was on uh, one of the trails in Blount County, and there was too, way too long a distance before I could get off. And I was just thinking if, I, if somebody else was alone walk in this, they'd really be feeling uncomfortable that if something happened, like, like they don't have options to, to get out. So just a lot, really, as much understanding, am I connected, are people seeing me, how safe do I feel, and, and how, what are, what are my options? But, you know, just the visual connection to interesting water features or a bridge or, or uh, an adaptive reuse of an old piece of industrial infrastructure, you know, those are, Again, every, everyone's unique. There's really no formula to it. Hi. Uh, as a former resident of Battery Park City who enjoyed watching the development of the High Line, uh, I was also aware of the massive increase in real estate value and the displacement mm -hmm. of older buildings and also long-term uh, renters and rental control apartments. As a one-month new resident to Chattanooga oh, wow. living downtown, Great. I'm wondering what safety How's it going? measures. What's that? How's it going? Yeah, good so far. Yeah, and uh, really Thank enjoying you. it. And um, what are the safety matters uh, measures that need to be put into place to make sure that my new apartment on Market downtown doesn't become an unaffordable place? because of all the great improvements that I see planned. Mm. Well, are you, are you in a rental building? I'm in a rental building, Market City. Uh, and it's, it's, un, it's unrestricted. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, you can't, can't, really, you can't really control the private market. But we should be creating as many housing options as possible so that people, as, you know, they're financial situation changes or their, the need for certain size apartment or the need for housing and services, that those different choices become available. But yeah, it, it's, there's really, there really is no way to, um, well, there, I'm not aware of, of, of ways to, to restrict private market housing, except, you know, St. Paul has enacted rent regulation, which has created a lot of anxiety. As a resident of New York, you're well aware of how New York City has really become a city of the rich. Manhattan has 
That's right. It's absolutely true. Um, it also, it does speak to the need for more home ownership, for wealth creation, for, again, for more people to have access to that. I mean, you're, you're getting into complicated housing policy where, you know, you could, you could enact rent restrictions that limit the amount of rental um, increases over time, which New York has, and which St. Paul Minnesota has enacted. Uh, but it does, in, in the case of St. Paul, uh, developers are saying they're not going to build in the city. They'll build elsewhere because of those limits on their ability to generate revenue and the fact that construction costs are so high. Yeah, there's absolutely a, an urgency in just about every community we're working in to find ways to leverage the resources that you have, land, and bond financing and tax credits and whatever else is available to, to generate lower cost housing. Um, and other concerns about about value changing um, the, the the culture and social value changing the economic value driving people out. Do you see the the ability to move freely and high um, high value transportation being able to maybe alleviate some of that shock from you know being downtown where you want to be you know now maybe three years from now you can only live four blocks or six blocks or 12 blocks away, but the things that you want to do are still there. Does it make sense that high value transportation could let you live somewhere more affordably, but still access the things that keep you here? Yeah, it's a great point. I would put that in my number one point category of better connect the assets you have. And the assets you have is a housing stock within the broader city environment, and you need to better connect it to the core. So yeah, tra tr investment in transit and better, better connections so that more of your housing stock is relevant as an acceptable you know, housing resource that has the kind of proximity that you want. Right? So 